Good morning and welcome to EAB University, a webinar series funded by the USDA Forest Service. My name is Robin Usborne from Michigan State University and along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you to today's presentation entitled, Is Firewood Still a Vector of Invasives? Which features a case study of firewood movement through the New Hampshire Speedway that reinforces the do not move firewood message. We are fortunate today to have Pira Siegert, the state entomologist for New Hampshire, as our presenter. Pira has been with the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food since 2010. She has a master's degree in entomology from Michigan State University and was in East Lansing from 1996 till 2010, giving her a front row seat to the detection and spread of emerald ash borer. Pira has been involved in discussions about recreational firewood throughout her time with the state of New Hampshire, starting with her hiring interview. Before we get started today, please know that we welcome your comments and questions. Please feel free to write them in the question and answer feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make a note of all the questions and we'll have Pira respond to them after the presentation has ended. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. There will be a link provided to you in the chat pod at the end of the webinar for a short, voluntary, confidential survey that I hope you'll take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag but we hope that you'll give us feedback either way. I will be sending out an email after the webinar with the survey link in case you weren't able to access it during the webinar. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to amystone at stone.91 at osu.edu. Certificates will be mailed to you within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info. You will also find the recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars there. All right, I'd like to thank you for attending today. And Pira, please unmute your microphone and you can share your screen with your presentation and we will get started. Um, I wanted to first thank Robin and Amy and Cliff and the uh, folks at EAB University for giving me the opportunity to talk to you um, about a subject which I'm sure is near and dear to everybody's hearts that works with Emerald Ash Borer, which is the recreational firewood pathway, its role in spreading Emerald Ash Borer, um, and uh, the use of outreach in order to impact and reduce the spread of Emerald Ash Borer through that recreational firewood pathway difficulties with regulating recreational firewood movement um, and impacts of emerald ash borer. We have a very uh, unique situation in New Hampshire where we were able to look at this opportunity for introduction of a pest on this pathway as well as a significant ash resource and um, a large infestation and impacts to landowners all in a very small area. And so it's a really nice microcosm of this setup. A lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today includes partnerships. So I would be remiss if I didn't point out that this webinar is a partnership between myself and then Nate Seeger with the US Forest Service. First, let's start with a sense of place. In other parts of the country, when people think about the Northeast, they often think about large metropolitan areas like Boston and New York City. However, the northeastern region is actually very heavily forested when compared to the rest of the U.S., and the impacts from introduced forest pests are significant. You can't help but remember New Hampshire every four years, but we're there even after the candidates move on to the next location. 
The live free or die state was the first of the colonies to establish a government independent of Great Britain's authority. It was the ninth state to ratify the U.S. Constitution, and it was the first to establish its own state constitution. New Hampshire's general court has 400 representatives and 24 senators, making it one of the largest elected bodies in the English-speaking world. New Hampshire has no general sales tax and no personal state income tax. New Hampshire is sandwiched between Maine and Vermont, and it, the state is known for this snowy-haired old gentleman, and not this one. Some facts about New Hampshire. There are just over 1,330,000 people that live in the state as of uh, July 1st, 2015 estimate. The land area of the state is 8,953 square miles, and the state has the smallest ocean coastline of any coastline state, which is 18 miles. Elevation ranges from sea level to the peak of Mount Washington and the presidential range of the White Mountains, which is the highest peak in the Northeast and the most prominent mountain east of the Mississippi River. The mountain is notorious for its erratic weather year round and holds the world record for the greatest recorded wind speed not involved with a tropical cyclone. Plant hardiness zones in New Hampshire range from 3B in the north to uh, 6A in the south along the seacoast region. And we've got a lot of woods. New Hampshire is a densely forested state with 84% of the land covered by trees. It's actually the second most densely forested state behind neighboring Maine. As Bill Bryson says in A Walk in the Woods, New Hampshire is one big forest. Of the state's 9,304 square miles of territory, some 85%, an area somewhat larger than Wales, is woods, and nearly all the rest is either lakes or above tree line. Most of New Hampshire is classified as rural by the USDA. It has significant forests in the timberland classification, and white pine, red oak, and soft maple are all important timber species. Much of the forests are privately owned. Unlike much of the Midwest, White ash only comprises about 4% of the state's rural and community hardwood forest trees. And New Hampshire also has the greatest tree cover per capita in its urban areas. And with diverse forests come diverse pest concerns. Like many of you, we survey and monitor for a wide array of insect pests. A few of the more common ones that we've been dealing with or which are on our radar include hemlock woolly adelgid which has spread to hemlocks in eight of, the tens, uh, eight of the state's 10 counties. It has moved in from the south since the early 2000s. In some of the southern towns in New Hampshire, we have elongated hemlock scale co-occurring with hemlock fully adopted. And where these two pests overlap, hemlock decline occurs faster. We also are starting to deal with red pine scale. This fairly recent detection is impacting large scale red pine plantings in 12 towns in four of the state's southern counties. Winter moth is causing defoliation in isolated areas in the state's seacoast region. Brown spruce longhorn beetle has not been found in New Hampshire, but it is in nearby Nova Scotia. Asian longhorn beetle is another pest that has never been found in New Hampshire. However, with a large infestation less than 30 miles away from the state border in Massachusetts, it is a pest of concern and one that we really don't want to have anything to do with. And of course, emerald ash borer, which, is, which has been detected in New Hampshire, but is still only located in isolated pockets and not yet causing widespread damage. Not only is there a lot of urban forest canopy in the state, but the urban centers are essentially scattered on a forested landscape, as you can see here uh, in the town of Dover which is set among a, a forest, essentially. Um, as a result, large forested areas tend to be in very close proximity to densely populated areas, popular event destinations, and centers of manufacturing, trade, and commerce. This increases the threat posed by invasive insect pests to our forests. Pura, are yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, no would it be possible to move a little closer to your mic? I, I guess on... Um, How about I move the mic a little closer to me? That sounds perfect. Okay, all right. Because it's not possible to get closer to the, to the mic. Okay. Is this better? Is this better for you? 
I can hear pretty well. I'm, I'm, I will, okay. I will see how people are doing. Thank All you. All right. Okay. No worries. So forests are vitally important to New Hampshire. They contribute to the economy, culture, and character of the state. Wood products are used to heat our homes and make electricity. And more tons of biomass chips are harvested in the state than hard or soft wood saw logs, pulp wood, or residential fuel wood. The proximity to the forest resource also means that many New Hampshire residents make or supplement their income through forest manufacturing or forest-based tourism. Basically, direct sales of forest-based manufacturing, forest-related re recreation and tourism, and Christmas tree maple syrup economies provide significant economic value to the state. In 2009, it added $2.259 billion in economic value, which was nearly 4% of, of the gross state product. And in 2009, that really was 2.8 million tons of wood harvested in the state. And the wood was harvested for firewood, for chips, and saw logs, and as pulp wood, and other products. In a state with long, cold winters, firewood is the only locally produced fuel source. One in 10 homes on average, are heated primarily by firewood. Many homes are heated with fuel oil and variations in fuel oil prices means that many commercial and residential buildings tend to reduce their overall heating costs by using wood products uh, in the form of firewood, biofuel chips, pellets, et cetera, as a secondary heat source. Every thousand acres of forest in New Hampshire supports 1.7 forest-based manufacturing jobs and 2.4 forest-based recreation and tourism jobs. Forest-based manufacturing in 2009 contributed $1.15 billion to New Hampshire's economy, 8,160 jobs with a $384 million payroll. Forest-based recreation and tourism is also very important in the state. Uh, it contributes $1.12 billion, 11,401 jobs, and a $224 million payroll. The Granite State's vibrant tourism economy thrives on those who come to enjoy our great forested outdoors. Campers, hunters, skiers, hikers, and leaf keepers who relish the autumnal color backdrop to colonial buildings and steeple churches tucked throughout the state's varied landscapes. An example of a popular tourism product in New Hampshire is maple syrup. Like many northern states, New Hampshire produces much maple syrup and has more than 500 sugar book producers. We also have approximately 200 Christmas tree farms around the state, and sales of Christmas trees, wreaths, and maple syrup is valued at over $7 million. Consequently, the threat posed by invasive forest pests to New Hampshire's economy and working landscapes elevates the urgency of enlisting broader support for outreach about the risks associated with transporting potentially infested material. Broader support in developing partnerships increases the opportunities for funding, audience access, amplification of the message. Having a variety of partnerships from private to nonprofits, extension and academia, and state and federal agencies means that you have a variety of missions which are represented and you can maximize each partner's core strengths. Of course, threats from invasive pests are not new. This map from Leopold et al. in 2013 shows the number of uh, forest pests per county throughout the U.S. As you go from a light yellow to a deeper blue, you increase the number of forest pests found in that county. And you can see that the Northeast has its fair share of forest pests. And this is due in large part to our history of industrialization, post tree diversity, and forest fragmentation, all of which promote pest arrival and establishment. Akama et al. 2010 compiled the historical accumulation of non-native forest pests in the U.S. and showed that non-native forest pests have uh, become established in the U.S. at a constant rate of about 2.5 species per year since the mid-1800s. If, however, you look at the number of economically damaging forest pests, what you find is that one economically damaging forest pest is established about once every two to three years. This slight uptick here at the end that starts in about the mid-1980s on this economically damaging forest pest line can in part be explained by a dramatic increase in the frequency of flown and wood borers which have been introduced and become established since the 1980s or so. 
These pests spend much of their lives out of sight, under tree bark and within wood, which makes them a challenge to detect. And right here, what this is, is um, we got a call from a home improvement store in the southern portion of the state. They had a bathroom vanity on the sales floor, and strange noises were coming from the vanity, and some sawdust was coming out. And when we took the vanity apart, uh, we found that there were two serendipity pupae in galleries within this leg of the vanity, and it was not visible, any, any damage was not visible from uh, external, um, external, externally viewing the chair leg. It was only when it was taken apart that we were actually able to see those pests. Longland wood borers are also the most costly insect guild, according to Akana et al. 2011. This graph shows the principal pathways of introductions of pests in multiple feeding guilds. So here we have sap feeders, foliage feeders, wooden comb feeders, and pathogens. The different colors represent the likely pathway in which they were introduced, with green being live plants, uh, pink is a hitchhiker, uh, orange is wood products, and blue is other or unknown. And what should really jump out to you is that the wood and foam feeders are really likely being introduced in those wood products. Um, and uh, so that includes solid wood packaging materials, logs, lumber, or other wood sources. Because they are hidden and not visible to visual detection, these wood boring insects are readily moved in trade goods as well as in solid wood packing materials. When the insects escape into new environments, there's a good chance that they will find new homes in nearby forested and landscaped trees. Uh, just as an aside, um, new detection technologies and targeting protocols are being used at the ports in order to increase the likelihood of detecting these wood boring pests before they enter U.S. commerce. So wood boring pests, because of the fact that they're hidden under the bark and within the wood, usually remain below the radar until their populations build to detectable levels. During this time, the populations are building, but essentially undetected, these pests are often unknowingly moved even greater distances in nursery stock and forestry products, especially in firewood moved for recreational purposes. Human-assisted movement of recreational firewood, like this clearly infested firewood here, uh, moves wood boring pests farther and faster than they can spread on their own. Okay, so we all know that moving firewood long distances is a high-risk endeavor for introducing undesirable pests to new areas. But firewood, for the many of the reasons mentioned earlier, remains an important and integral commodity in New Hampshire. Recognizing that the tone of our outreach is critical to success, we emphasize that firewood rules are not about limiting the use of firewood, but rather the rules are about the proper sourcing of firewood used in the state in order to reduce likelihood of introduction of a pest as part of protecting our forest. And firewood is also unique among forest products in that it is moved both along a commercial pathway and a recreational pathway. If you think about other forest products, logs, sawn lumber, chips, these are generally not moved by a homeowner with a pickup truck. Firewood, however, is. And one might even argue that the pathway for recreational firewood transportation is broader than that of the commercial pathway. Although the end use of the product is the same, it's burned, because of the differences in the way that firewood is harvested, handled, and transported, firewood transported commercially and firewood transported recreationally are not the same pathway. And the recreational pathway also does not lend itself well to regulation. Recreational movement of firewood presents a unique challenge for regulators. It is difficult to identify the individuals that are moving firewood. It is difficult to detect when the firewood has been moved, and it's difficult to reconstruct the path along which that firewood was moved. And there are limited tools available for responding to a private citizen's action. And if your end goal for firewood rules are future compliance, a system that encourages personal responsibility is likely to be more effective than one that emphasizes punitive damages. The reason that recreational and commercial firewood transportation differ is largely due to the longer distances recreational firewood can be moved, and that transporters of recreational firewood generally don't have uh, any special knowledge of forests, forestry, or pests that may be in the firewood. Recreational transporters of firewood do not consider the transportation costs or the fuel costs when they move the firewood. 
and so are more likely to move at farther distances than a commercial transporter would. Really, they're mostly considering the ambience of their outdoor recreational experience and the fact that they want to have a campfire. And there are some concerns that when they arrive at their uh, outdoor recreation site that there should be firewood readily available. And if that means taking firewood from home that is readily available to ensure that experience, that's something they're more likely to do. Recreational transporters often don't have any specialized forestry knowledge and therefore really don't know what they possibly could be moving. And there's often a wide range in quality of firewood that is transported for recreation. In New Hampshire, we've seen really high quality split and season firewood moved recreationally. However, we've also seen wood so punky that it's not, it's not certain that it will actually burn. And we've even seen firewood harvested so recently that it still had fresh leaves attached to it. And when you're moving firewood in this condition, the odds of delivering a happy and healthy pest to a new area increase dramatically. All of these factors make recreational firewood challenging, if not impossible to regulate. Because of these challenges, outreach is our best strategy for changing recreational firewood transportation behaviors by increasing public awareness of the risks and encouraging personal responsibility for protecting the resources. So in 2006, with news spreading about emerald ash borer detections in the Midwestern states, the New Hampshire Division of Forests and Lands, which is responsible for uh, forest health protection in the state, conducted a quick and dirty study to see what kinds of insect pests they saw emerging from firewood. They went to campgrounds and accepted donations of firewood. There were 19 different donations, and you can see that the donations may have been comprised of more than one piece of firewood. Collections of firewood came from campers from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and New York. Each sample was placed in a rearing barrel, sealed, and aged. Emerging insects and other arthropods were periodically collected and identified. 650 insects, representing nine orders and 22 families, came from these 19 samples of firewood. This study provided local evidence that transportation of out-of-state firewood could represent a risk of introducing an insect pest to New Hampshire's forest. Following this study, in 2009, state and federal agencies banned out-of-state firewood on state lands and on the White Mountain National Forest. In the summer of 2011, this ban on out-of-state firewood, with qualified exemptions, was extended to all lands within New Hampshire's jurisdictional boundaries. Detections of emerald ash borer in 2013, 2014, and 2015 added restrictions on hardwood firewood movement within the state of New Hampshire as part of an effort to slow the spread of ash mortality within the state. Ah, emerald ash borer, the poster child for movement of pests and firewood a concern for New Hampshire's forest since it was first detected in Detroit in 2002. The shoe finally dropped in New Hampshire in late March of 2013, when emerald ash borer was detected in a large emergent ash tree in downtown Concord and near to the intersection of I-89 and I-93. The original ash tree that was uh, found to be infested with emerald ash borer was showing heavy woodpecker damage, and in fact, a lot of the detections that we've had in, in New Hampshire have been a result of visual survey and woodpecker damage. Response to emerald ash borer in the state has been a cooperative effort between state and federal regulatory agencies, forest health agencies, and UNH Cooperative Extension, which leads the outreach effort, including coordination of the website NHBUGS. NHBUGS has been a really useful tool for us in New Hampshire, so I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about it. Um, and, and we'll talk about it again a little bit later. NHBUGS was actually originally developed because cooperating agencies in the state felt that we needed a single clearinghouse uh, for information about forest pest issues. Prior to the launch of this website, uh, people in the state would submit photos of insects or damaged trees to multiple authorities in the state, and then we would trip over each other's toes as we all responded to the same question from the same individual with much of the same response. Cooperative Extension had already developed a photo upload interface for another project, and we decided that a similar report of suspect tree or insect photo upload should exist as the backbone of this new website. We also thought that a photo gallery comprised of photos that had already been submitted by other people in the state would be um, an attractive addition to the website. 
We decided to give it a catchy and easy to remember name, NH Bugs. And even though the use of the word bugs is probably anathema to entomologists out there, it's been really easy for people to remember and to pick up and to use. The website was actually developed in early 2012 as part of a Farm Bill Forest Pest Outreach and Survey project. So by the time EAB was found in the state, state and federal partners quickly agreed that we needed a single unified source to get information out about EAB and the, and the current infestation to the state's residents and industries. NH Bugs was already developed and he was ready to serve in this role. Information posted on this site is vetted by all partner agencies and updated quickly as needed. That it's housed by cooperative extension means that it's free from potential state and federal website design requirements. And it is used as the repository for all information related to EAB and New Hampshire. And when partners give talks about Emerald Ash for its impact, this is the site that everyone directs people to. Uh, in addition to information about Emerald Ash Borer and management of trees, um, quarantine information, it also links to uh, other resources like emeraldashborer.info and dumplingfirewood.org. Powerful tool in the state and is an example of cooperating partners using their strengths and working together to leverage resources in New Hampshire. But getting back to the forest, the Northeast and the Upper Midwest have the highest densities of ash trees per acre. And although ash only represents about 4 to 8 percent of New England's trees, and on this map you can see the green areas are the predicted areas where ash occurs, um, there the, some parts of the region are heavily stocked with ash, such as the Connecticut River Valley here between Vermont and New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, we've done surveys of landscape trees that show that some communities have significant investment in landscape ash trees. And particularly where we saw ash being planted in landscapes was in parts of the state where you would expect a high percentage of ash in the forest resource, like in Cheshire and Bracken County, as well as in developments with landscaping contracts, like apartment complexes and retirement communities. In New Hampshire, since March of 2013, emerald ash borer has been found in 16 towns and four counties. These red areas on this map are towns and areas in which emerald ash borer is known to occur. The orange areas are basically what we call the potential expansion area, and that is an area within 10 miles of a known emerald ash borer infestation. You can see the rest of the state is in green. That's what we call the EAB alert area, and that's essentially where we've told um, homeowners and, and municipalities that they should take inventory of their ash resource and decide on an ash management plan should emerald ash borer be detected near their region. The first detection occurred here in Concord, and almost a year after the first detection, there was a detection of emerald ash borer in the Canterbury and Loudoun areas. I'm going to be talking a lot about Canterbury and Loudoun for the rest of this talk. That detection came about from a, um, a bulletin that Cooperative Extension had placed in February, I believe, of that year, asking people to take a walk through their woods in the snow and look for ash trees which were showing signs of blonding or woodpecker damage and report them. And following that bulletin, we got several several reports of woodpecker stripped trees in this area. Also in 2014, a population of emerald ash borer was found in Ware in Hillsborough County, and a population was found here in Salem uh, in Rockingham County. Uh, in 2015, Populations of emerald ash borer were detected on traps in, in Belknap County in, in these towns. So we have four of the ten counties now have uh, are within the emerald ash borer quarantine. So the remainder of this presentation is really going to focus on the neighboring towns of Canterbury and Loudoun because that's the location for this microcosm that I talked about where you have opportunity for introduction, a resource at risk, an actual infestation, and impact to landowners. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of the Canterbury and Loudoun emerald ash borer detection is that this was really the first detection in the state where the forest resource was impacted. All previous detections were in urban areas where the, mostly the trees that were impacted were landscape and street trees. Canterbury and Loudoun are rural, they have lots of woods, and these towns are home to maple syrup producers, firewood vendors, and the historic Shaker Village. Once home to a community of Shakers, and which manages and managed ash on its property for use in traditional basketry. 
This map is the ash resource in the town of Canterbury, Loudoun, and some surrounding towns. Basically, quadrats that are white have very low ash basal area. Red has very high ash basal area. So you can see that the town of Canterbury in particular has a lot of ash in it. Um, the ash is white ash, but there's also a lot of black ash in the swamps. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of how outstanding the woodpecker damage was in Canterbury and Loudoun when it was reported to us in March of 2014. Um, some of these trees are off of a main road and back on people's properties. And so having cooperative extension uh, put that bulletin out to describe what blonding is. And blonding is the removal of the outer layer of bark on an ash tree by woodpeckers foraging for emerald ash borer. And having them put that information out really helped to, um, to detect this pest uh, in a fairly reasonable uh, time. Uh, what you can see here is a couple of uh, ash trees that have really been stripped of their outer bark. And here, some of that bark has been peeled off, and you can see uh, those S-shaped serpentine galleries. And the woodpecker damage happened in a very short period of time. Many of our emerald ash borer detections happen uh, in New Hampshire between the months of February and April as the result of the blonding trees from, from this woodpecker activity. So we clearly have a, a very healthy uh, woodpecker population in the state. And so you can see distinctive serpentine galleries and a lot of distinctive serpentine galleries uh, below the bark of these trees that are occurring in Canterbury and Love. The infestation was first noted in late March, and by June of that year, crown dieback was already visible on ash trees near Canterbury Shaker Village. Canterbury residents were very involved and interested in the infestations and the potential impacts, and several trainings were held on the property of cooperating private landowners. Some of these sites have also been used for biocontrol releases, and demonstration projects have been set up on the Shaker State Forest. So how much pressure is there in Canterbury and Lab? So we did a study last year where we placed three green funnel traps and two purple panel traps at the location uh, where some of the photos of trees were that I showed you. Over the course of the summer, the purple panel traps caught a total of nine emerald ash bar and the green funnel traps caught a total of 331 emerald ash bar, which is more than a 24-fold increase when you adjust for trap. We also deployed purple panel traps and green funnel traps in a pair design in Belknap County. Belknap County had not yet had an emerald ash borer detection, but based on its proximity to known populations, we were assuming it was going to be detected pretty quickly. But one might assume that because it hadn't been detected yet, that the populations were lower than what we were experiencing in Canterbury. And in that setting, where we had a paired design of the green funnel traps to the purple panel traps and a presumably low population model, these two traps caught equivalently. And while these comparisons are limited and the sample sizes are small, it's given us the impression that these purple panel traps are really quite uh, reasonably to, reasonable to use for detection of emerald ash borer in low population situations, and that you can maximize your effort by deploying lots of the purple panel traps in that kind of setup. Um, but that where you know you have a population and where these green funnel traps are a little bit more labor intensive because they need to be checked more regularly, they are really best deployed um, in areas with known populations in order to inform management decisions. So as with any pest that is moved in recreational firewood, where there's a location that attracts campers, there's the opportunity for the introduction of a pest. States see this over and over again. That's why traps and surveys often target destinations like campgrounds, music festivals, and entertainment venues where large numbers of people from a large geographic area congregate to camp and recreate, often bringing firewood with them. In New Hampshire, it happens that the largest entertainment venue that meets these criteria is the New Hampshire Motor Speedway, which is located in the Loudoun Canterbury area. We've been fortunate to have partnered with the New Hampshire Motor Speedway for several years and have had the opportunity to benefit from the partnership as part of our recreational firewood outreach programs. So in Canterbury and Loudoun, we have the opportunity for introduction, we have a resource at risk, we have an infestation, and we have impacts to landowners in the community. So the New Hampshire Motor Speedway is a target for firewood movement and it's a partner for outreach. 
It's the largest sports facility in New England. It can seat 88,000 people, which is roughly 7% of the state's entire population. Roughly 500,000 visitors pass through its gates each year, or about 40% of New Hampshire's population passes through the gates of the Speedway every year. It's located on 1,200 largely wooded acres. You can see from this picture that forests, and this is the Canterbury side, so these are ash-dense forests, uh, surround the Speedway. The scenic and forested setting for the Speedway is one of the attractions, and it is a fun, family-friendly camping destination. This makes the New Hampshire Motor Speedway both a target for long-distance transportation of firewood, as well as a landowner impacted by the transportation of destructive forest pests. In fact, the Speedway has partnered with various state and federal agencies in promoting information about firewood transportation and risks associated with it since 2011. These are the primary partnerships uh, involved with uh, working on firewood transportation uh, events at the Speedway. And I want to point out that while all these agencies have been involved, none of the work that I'm going to report to you would have been possible without the um, efforts of the Speedway itself, as well as with uh, New Hampshire's forest rangers, who are really responsible for a lion's share of coordinating these efforts. The Speedway adjoins the towns of Loudoun and Canterbury, as I mentioned. Among other activities, it hosts two NASCAR races a year, one in July and one in September, and multiple other car and motorcycle races. It boasts mountain bike trails through its woods and hosts community-friendly events like the Extreme Chunking event in October, when teams from across the U.S. bring in trebuchets, catapults, and air cans to compete to see how far the machines can throw pumpkins and the gift of lights, which makes for a fun seasonal visit during the, hol during the winter holidays. There are approximately 18 million people from the northeastern states and the Canadian provinces that are within 200 miles of the New Hampshire Motor Speedway. So it draws from a large, heavily populated geographic area. And campfires are permitted at the Speedway as long as conditions allow. Note how close the event is to the surrounding woodlands. The two races at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway represent the two largest camping events in the state each year. Approximately 75% of the 5,000 campsites at the Speedway are occupied by out-of-state race fans. There's a high risk for firewood movement. However, that risk is high opportunity for outreach to increase awareness about the risks associated with moving pests and wood. It also provides a fun atmosphere for race fans and their families, and an important part of that experience is the ambiance of a campfire. When you have 5,000 campers in a fairly small area, one might recognize <laughs> that there are fire safety considerations when you have uh, this many campers and this many campfires together. And the New Hampshire's Rangers have been partnering with the Speedway for years to provide outreach about fire dangers. As such, when the state began to address issues with transportation of pests and firewood, there was already a private state partnership in place that could be used for outreach initiatives. The first initiative uh, came in September following the uh, enactment of our out-of-state firewood quarantine, when personnel from the New Hampshire Division of Forests and Lands and the Division of Plant Industry visited the New Hampshire Motor Speedway for a day before one of the September races. The goal of the visit was to survey out-of-state attendees about their knowledge and their general knowledge about firewood transportation bans and their firewood movement habits. Interviewees were provided with information about forest pests and requests were made for donations of out-of-state firewood for an insect emergence study. Although there were no regulatory actions associated with this survey, violators were informed that future compliance checks could include firewood confiscations and potential fines. So what were the results of this survey? First of all, we talked to about 72 different, um, different campers at the, at the Speedway. They came from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, Virginia, Vermont, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. 28 of the people that we interviewed were aware of firewood bans. 22 admitted to bringing firewood with them at that visit. Awareness was highest from the Canadian provinces likely due to the fact that firewood is not supposed to cross the international border. About 40% of attendees from the surrounding New England states had some familiarity with firewood rules, 
and they had both positive and negative things to say about firewood rules when we chatted with them. Firewood that was transported primarily came from the New England states and New York. But in spite of high familiarity with firewood transportation rules, one uh, of our Canadian uh, interviewees had brought firewood with them. When they were originally interviewed, they said that they did not have firewood. And then after we moved on to talk with some other folks, uh, they came back to us and admitted, in fact, that they did have firewood and they opened up their camper and they showed where the firewood came from. And then they donated it to the uh, uh, insect emergency. Study. So following this initial survey, Firewood checkpoints were organized and run at the, at the Speedway by the forest rangers in 2013, 2014, and 2015. State and federal partners provided support and served as technical experts for the rangers at these events. Uh, in the pre-event uh, analysis, the Speedway staff indicated that most of the out-of-state attendees arrived on the Wednesday through Friday preceding the Sunday race, and the checkpoints ran on these days from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. The goal of these checkpoints wasn't to nab people for bringing in firewood from out of state, but rather to increase knowledge about the risks associated with firewood transportation, increase their opportunity for voluntary compliance with firewood quarantines, um, and also to process the violations with a minimum of inconvenience for the attendees and to respect the roles of the partners in their event. There was a lot of planning done on the part of the rangers in order to ensure that there was sufficient staff on hand to process violations quickly and get violators on their way to their recreational experience. Another important goal was maintaining personnel safety in a variety of weather conditions, including extreme heat on the tarmac and occasionally heavy traffic. I want to reemphasize that people are coming to the Speedway for entertainment, for fun, with family and friends. And although no one likes having their firewood confiscated, having it done with a minimum of inconvenience by a courteous and professional staff and being provided with information as to the forest health risks as to why the event is happening does lessen the sting for many families. Many of the states that attendees came from have their own firewood rules and sometimes campers were aware of these rules and sometimes they were not. So a lot of outreach was provided on a regional and not just a state level. As I said, these checkpoints were not gotcha events. Um, as such, information about the checkpoints was published well before they occurred, and uh, as was well risks associated with firewood transportation. The New Hampshire Motor Speedway website has information on it about firewood rules and firewood transportation. There are firewood vendors available at the speedway as well as at stores and gas stations leading to the speedway. There was information published in the New Hampshire Motor Speedway Campers Guide, and it was right next to the critical information about where the bathrooms are located and how to buy ice. So it was in a very heavily visible section of the guide. Um, information was also mailed to ticket holders. There were press releases on the newspaper and radio. And sometimes this got picked up by NASCAR related Facebook and Twitter accounts. Such as this one from September of 2013 at Tracks Day to attention all at NASCAR, campers don't need firewood. So how did the checkpoints run? Um, the checkpoint occurred on the entry road into the New Hampshire Motor Speedway. All campers enter on this road and have to have their camping permit verified by Speedway staff before they can proceed to their campsite. So rangers stood with the New Hampshire Motor Speedway staff on the entry road, and when a camper or truck came in with out-of-state plates, they were, the rangers asked them if they were carrying out-of-state firewood. If they verbally confirmed that they had out-of-state firewood or there was firewood visible in plain sight, um, the violator was directed to a nearby staging area where another ranger would process the violation while partners assisted to remove firewood from the vehicle and stacked it nearby. There was outreach material available on site, including insect displays, and there was brochures and handouts that, that could be given to, to folks that we interacted with to give them more information. Some years, we also had vouchers for bundles of firewood available as well. Each confiscated load of firewood was assembled, given an individual identifying number and photograph in order to preserve the chain of evidence. After the load of firewood was documented, the wood was consolidated with other loads until the dump truck was full, at which point it was taken over to either a location on the Speedway property or to a Loudontown dump where it was burned under the supervision of fire safety personnel. 
all confiscated firewood was destroyed before the end of each night at the checkpoint. And you can see that this is a fairly significant amount of firewood that's already been burned and firewood being added to the pile. In summary, across these four checkpoints, there were 271 loads of firewood confiscated at this paper. There has been a decline in firewood confiscations over time, from a high of 115 at the first event in July of 2013, to a low in the mid-30s in the most recent two events. There have been no repeat offenders um, in, at these checkpoints. In fact, over the years, rangers have reported um, that are standing on the road that when they ask the question about out-of-state firewood, many attendees say, no, you got me last time, I'm not bringing any this time. Um, many people are also seeming to come in now with receipts for where firewood was purchased locally, which is very positive. Um, and both of these show that there is an impact on, on firewood transportation behavior, which is the ultimate goal. Um, when firewood was brought in from out of state, loads range from very small and just a few sticks to entire pickup truck loads. The quality varied uh, among the loads as well. Um, and often, as you can see in this picture, there's quite a bit of ash in those loads um, that, come, that come in. However, species was not um, was among the data collected from these events as uh, often it was fairly busy confiscating and documenting these loads and the, um, the species of trees as it was not uh, retained. As one might expect, given the geographic draw of the New Hampshire Motor Speedway, 80% of the confiscated firewood came from within 200 miles of New Hampshire. On the x-axis, we have the driving distance of miles. On the y-axis, the number of firewood intersections. Um, since the, uh, however, there were also instances of long distance transportation as well, with firewood intercepted from California, Florida, Georgia, Washington, and West Virginia. Sometimes firewood traveled more than 3,000 miles to come to speak. About 15% of the, of the firewood that was confiscated originated from within the federal Emerald Ash or quarantine area. The good news is that no firewood came from within an Asian long term beetle quarantine area, although 2% did come from towns adjacent to the ALD quarantine areas in either Massachusetts and New York. So here's a map that essentially shows a lot of things. Um, and the first thing I want to draw your attention to are all of these black ovals. These are actually the oval race tracks in the US. The one in Loudoun is represented by a red oval. So this is where different speedways um, that are oval are occur in the US. Counties from which firewood is transported to the speedway are shown colored in from yellow to dark brown. The yellow counties represent counties where only one to two interceptions occurred from firewood brought to the speedway. The darker the color means there was more firewood that came from that county to the speedway. And so, as you might expect, most of these interceptions occurred from quite close to where the speedway is located. Superimposed on this map is also the federal Emerald Ash Borough quarantine, as shown in a green hash mark, and the purple. Uh, Canadian Emerald Ash Borough Quarantine Area uh, up here. And so you can see that from within the EAB Quarantine Area, there was quite a bit of, of firewood movement at the speedway. And we did have movement here from California, Washington, and Florida. These stars represent interceptions of firewood from across the international border, some of which uh, was hidden and some of which was in plain sight. Um, the vehicle that came in here from Quebec Actually, it was an open pickup truck with just a full load of firewood in it. So when they were, learned that they weren't supposed to bring it across the border, I kind of thought maybe they had just gotten rather really lucky at the timing of the crossing. So there were a lot of outcomes from this case study. There was a decline over time in firewood transported to the speedway, and there were no repeat offenders. It was the opportunity to provide outreach to residents in surrounding states. And, and to show that there was some consistency in, in thought in terms of the risks of firewood transportation. Because of the focus on firewood in these towns, there was also the opportunity to uh, coordinate with private landowners uh, and develop some best management practices for firewood movement within a quarantine area in order to reduce the spread of unrolled ash flow within a quarantine area. 
And there is also um, a project that is in development between the Forest Service, state agencies, and private landowners looking at firewood harvesting practices and processing to see if there's a way to reduce survivorship of animal ash borer. And essentially, there's been an increased focus on outreach on the outreach-based approach for recreational transporters of firewood in the state of New Hampshire, which has led to the development of the Interagency Firewood Transportation Work Group. And members of a number of agencies are on this work group, including the Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, Safety, Fish and Game, and several divisions within um, the Department of Resources and Economic Development, which is similar to DNR type uh, agencies out west, including forests and lands, parks and recreation, the forest rangers, and travel and tourism. UNH, a cooperative extension, is involved. And Don't Move Firewood has helped us develop some of our outreach materials. And of course, all of this information is available through NH funds. Uh, funding for some of these projects came from Farm Bill 10 007 funds. And we have developed in the state large aluminum uh, signs that will go welcome centers and points of interest, weather resistant posters to put at campgrounds, town halls, fire stations, rest areas, boat launches, uh, hiking kiosks, all sorts of places, electronic billboards, a PSA which ran on local Comcast stations and is available for NH bugs and information to be distributed to private campgrounds uh, about simplifying the fire transportation message. And what I'm most excited about right now is that we've recently joined Firewood Scout, which you know, should make it easier for the recreational transporter of firewood to find local firewood in the state and influence them to leave their firewood at home. Firewood Scout is a smartphone-enabled website that uses Google Maps for geo-referencing local firewood vendors. New Hampshire is a heavily forested state, Firewood is locally available, and markets and prices are competitive. We currently have more than 500 vendors of firewood listed in New Hampshire and anticipate adding additional vendors. Uh, the goal for New Hampshire with Firewood Scout was to identify as many vendors of camp firewood as possible so that visitors to the state would know that they could have a selection. We've also, within the last month, had NH Bugs launch a new web page, Firewood for Campers, which simplifies the message for them where you can't bring firewood from, and then with a link to Firewood Scout, where you can bring firewood from. Uh, we're asking private campgrounds to link directly to this page so that all the campgrounds in the state are providing consistent and accurate messaging about firewood. Also, as of Monday of this week, um, we launched a social media presence for NH Bugs. We realized that all of our cooperating agencies in the state drive people to NH Bugs for information, but that NH Bugs had no social media presence. Cooperative Extension has developed a marketing plan for NH Bugs, um, and, and participating state agencies have agreed to take responsibility providing content. And I just want to point out that this webinar was promoted on NH Bugs this week. And I'd be gratified to hear if any of the attendees learned about us through the NH Bugs Facebook page. So, in summary, recreational firewood is a documented invasion pathway. It's difficult to regulate, but prime for outreach opportunities. Creative and diverse partnerships are essential. Engaging the public, increasing their awareness and concern, and along with effective and cost-efficient ways to access local firewood vendors is likely the best strategy moving forward with reducing risk from invasive forest pests moving in recreational firewood by other enthusiasts. The shift away from transporting firewood recreational should, recreationally should not be expected to happen overnight. Even though significant efforts have been made on the state-by-state -state and national level to draw attention to this forest health protection issue, this um, presentation should draw attention to the fact that outreach efforts need to be ongoing. And I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Pira. Um, this has really been enlightening for me, and not only f talking about the communications, but learning more about New Hampshire. I didn't realize it was quite so forested. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cliff Sadoff says, uh, the Firewood Scout app seems like a good way to get local sources to New Hampshire visitors. He made that comment. Um, and w the question is, what pests emerged from the chambers in that one photo that you showed us earlier? So we didn't have anything that was an invasive emerge from the chambers. Uh, there were a lot of ants 
Um, there were some uh, bark beetles. Um, there were some wood lice, um, but uh, I think there were some local serendipsids. Um, and you, know, you had some spiders and, and things, which I didn't include in the numbers of insects for obvious reasons. But um, yeah, so nothing, nothing too surprising. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Did you do you find that there is one type of communication bet that works better than and maybe another to make folks like the campers aware of the quarantine on firewood, or is it kind of you just need to kind of paint a broad brush? I think you have to use a variety of tools to get the message out. And sometimes I feel like when you do outreach. Um, you put a lot of information out there, but you don't get too much feedback. Um, so I think you have to you have to do everything. You have to do social media. I think you have to do uh, signs. I think you have to do um, uh, newspaper articles. I think PSAs are helpful. Um, and then we do a lot of expos as well. Okay, Cliff um, has also commented the fact that any live insects were present in the logs demonstrate the risk of moving live living organisms. That's yes. a very enlightening study. Yes, yes, I, I agree. All right. Um, also, I was wondering, do you have one person or a number of people that are dedicated to doing outreach for the, um, the quarantine and, and about Emerald Ash Borer in New Hampshire? So one of the things about New Hampshire is it's a small state, right? And so we have to learn to maximize our resources. So, so I would say that we all do it. We don't have a person who's dedicated to it. Um, and we try to work both with ourselves, uh, with the Division of Forest and Lands, and with UNH Cooperative Extension and the County Foresters. And everybody cooperates together to do outreach. Um, often we coordinate some of the outreach activities. Um, but we all do a little bit of it. OK. That's always a question I like to try to find is helpful for my own work as well. Um, I just so people know, I'm putting the survey in the chat pod um, for folks to look at um, and to please uh, do that survey for us. Um, Morgan says, what other states participate in Firewood Scout, and is it easy to join? <laughs> well, that is a good question, Morgan, and I want to say that Morgan is the person in my office who actually has done most of the efforts uh, with Firewood Scout. So, so uh, it's a little bit of a loaded question, although I didn't ask her to ask it. So the other states that are currently in Firewood Scout include California, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Tennessee. Um, I think the arrangement is it's $1,000 the first year for setup, $250 the second year. Um, they've been really easy to work with, um, and they want to see, uh, I think, 100, um, 100 vendors listed in the state for participation and then providing um, some promotion of Firewood Scout as well. All right, thank you. Um, I've been asked to put Amy Stone's email in the chat pod, and I am doing that right now for all of those um, who are looking for CEUs. Let's see if I can do that to everyone, too. I should have hit everyone here. Um, thank you very much, Pira, for all your work on this. This has been very enlightening. Um, we've had a good crowd um, today, and we're really happy that um, you were, you know, took the time and were able to give us all this information. Um, are there any other questions just before we kind of wrap it up here? Um, I, again, this has been, this is always enlightening to hear what other states are doing, and we do get a lot of requests from people asking, uh, from other states, asking how other folks are doing this kind of of thing with uh, communications and management and control and you know especially like you say when you got folks coming in from all over it looks like all over the country mm -hmm. to you know to uh, participate in you know all the, the things that they can do there in New Hampshire um, it always is kind of one of those things how do you how do you keep it all together <laughs> <So>. <laughs> all right folks um, again I will be sending out um, um, 
the information on the survey and I will give you again um, Amy Stone's email and um, in an email that I'll be sending out to all the folks who participated today. Uh, thank you all for participating. I'm going to be closing the meeting here in just another minute. And Pira, thanks again for, for joining us today and, and providing us with this great information. And thank again, you. thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes, you're welcome. And again, this recording will be on the Emerald Ashbore University YouTube site on, um, uh, and, and the link to it will be provided on the emeraldashbore.info website as well a little later on today. And with that, I think uh, we're good. And um, thanks again, and I'm going to be ending the meeting. <laughs>